Hello and welcome to the Holistic Fitness Podcast, where you'll learn how to get your goals without burning out. I'm your host, Lori, and this show isn't just about movement or nutrition. You probably already know that exercise and nutrition is important for your mental and physical health and well-being. It's also about stress management, mindset, and shedding those limiting beliefs and working through some of that childhood trauma while you're at it. Today, I'm joined by Dr. Joylyn Sparkles. Joylyn is a creator of The Happiness Clinic. She is fierce and unwavering in her belief in one's ability to be off the charts happy. She is a self-love specialist, happiness trainer, and expert in communication and relationship dynamics. She simplifies complex and conflicting information and offers pragmatic tools to help high-functioning individuals and organizations move forward by showing them the quote-unquote backwards way of putting happiness first, changing the way that they see and talk to themselves and each other so that they can be more confident, happy, and enjoy greater freedom in self-expression and have a lasting impact. In this episode, Joylyn and I chat about sustainable goal getting, how trauma can impact your fitness, and nutrition, and emotional resilience. If you struggle seeing the bright side of life and feel like there's some sort of invisible barrier between you and your goals, stay tuned. How are you going this morning, Joylyn? I'm doing great. How are you doing this morning? I mean, I'm not a morning person, but, you know, seeing as we've got the happiness clinic on, we've got Joylyn Sparkles on, I will, you know, get all my positivity, even though it's the morning. (laughs) Yeah, I'll be sending you good morning vibes through the computer. And I say I'm kind of a morning person. I wake up pleasant, but I don't often wake up super early. So mm. at least coherent. So this should go okay. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I love that. Um, I'm really excited to speak to you because I am, what did my friends refer to me as? Terribly optimistic and positive. So I feel like you and I might have that in common, just being like a happy person. But I know for myself, like that didn't come naturally. I've trained myself to be optimistic. So Mm -hmm. I'm sure you have some sort of backstory, some reason why you help people in the way that you do. Can you share more about how you got to where you are now? Absolutely. And I talk about the happiness clinic. A lot of people think, yeah, I popped out you know, just like fun shine bear. Oh, everything's rainbows and sparkles. But the happiness clinic was actually born from a lot of unhappiness. I, um, I early childhood trauma, um, infant trauma, which was never actually a bad thing. It wasn't one of those made for TV movie stories, but my mom had complications from our birth and had to go back in the hospital. So our family rallied, but that was too many caregivers for a little kid but nobody knew that then. And then it actually got followed up with a whole heap of abuse. There was some uh, sexual abuse from when I was little. And then again, in junior high, um, my dad has still does (laughs) a, a noticeable temper and just lots of different ways of internalizing stress and that I wasn't good enough And so making my life trying to be perfect so that I wouldn't get chosen for abuse so that I could blend in. And it just didn't work. And to where by the time I was in junior high and then in college, I actually attempted suicide for the first time. I had struggled with eating disorders, lots of depression and anxiety that wasn't quite classic. So it wasn't called anxiety, but always just worrying and living my life, sort of watching myself from the outside to see if I was okay all the time. And then recognizing that there was a problem, you know, wanting to kill yourself isn't something that's healthy and that's easy to spot. And then in medical school, recognizing that my eating disorder was really taking up a whole lot of my mental space that I needed for studying. And I I knew I needed to do something. And so getting into therapy and, and really working hard, but then after years of conventional talk therapy, I was like, when do I actually get to be happy? When is this going to happen? Like, when is it going to click? Like I've cried, I've processed, I have a really good understanding of where so many of these issues came from, but how come I'm not happy? And it was like you said, it was 
actually just, I had a habit of being unhappy. I had a habit of looking at the world at what's missing, what's wrong, and still a habit of looking at what am I going to fix? How, what's wrong with me so I can fix it? And those were still just putting me through the unhappy path. And then I had to just recognize it was about doing things and being something different and and really changing. I had internalized from all this trauma that being pessimistic, it had it has a higher survival rating. It really, truly does with our human brains, but that it doesn't do a whole lot for actually living and feeling happy. And so having to really turn and look at what was there, what I was grateful for, acknowledge how far I'd come and and start recognizing other practices that would help me overcome emotional intensity and handle my emotions better so that I could actually feel present and feel good in my body and show up smiling that was real. And when good things happen to other people to authentically be happy for them and happy for myself and that things weren't too good to be true and learning how to actually hold that in my body. And so I could have that in my life. Wow. Joylyn, what a story you have. I'm so sorry to hear that you went through so much abuse as a child and in junior high to the point where, you know, everything built up, you internalized it and you actually thought about, well, tried to take your life and then also had an eating disorder that took up a lot of space in, in, uh, in college. It's, those aren't small things to go through. You, you know what I mean? Like, I feel right. like, you know, the reasons that I wasn't happy was much less, I guess, extreme, um, not to compare trauma, but, you know, you, it seems like you you very much had reasons to internalize things. I'm curious, can you tell me more about your thought process or like the sorts of things you were thinking before you were at the point where I just really need to end it, like the world is better off without me? It's interesting. That is one of the thoughts is the world is better off without me. I knew that I was sad and and I just felt like I was a burden on other people and just having a hard time having joy in the day. Everything was just about getting by. And there was always something there that that knew I was meant for more than just getting by, but I just couldn't get out of it. And then feeling like I was always excluded that uh, the good things happen to other people, but they wouldn't happen to me. Having a very religious mother and background that I was born sinful and so that there was something inherently wrong with me. And so just searching to find it and seeing all this evidence that, yeah, that's why. And, you know, with an eating disorder, it just, then you think that the fix is the number on the scale. And if I could just get it to that, but then when it, it gets that or close, things still feel awful. And so there's just this constant mismatch of how I feel on the inside to where the outside, anything good can be rationalized out of it, or it doesn't last long enough, or it very much just strengthens and solidifies what I was already thinking that there's something wrong with me. Um, I'm just, it's never going to get better. Life is really hard. I'm in this all alone. Nobody really cares. And if they care, it's only because they're, they don't really mean it. You know, they're just selfish. They're just, you know, religious or they, they have to for some shit's my mom. She has to, you know, that kind of thing to where nobody really cares about me. And what's really interesting is there really is. And one of the biggest healing things that I've noticed is it was like living life from the outside. It was almost like I was never totally in my body. I was always watching myself live so that I was even one of the people who would be the most critical of me of, Oh, look at what you did. You did that again, or I can't believe you did that, or that's so embarrassing, or you're, you look awful, you know, just really highly critical things. Wow. It almost sounds like if you can criticize yourself first, then you like, it's almost like a protection mechanism. It's like people can't hurt me if I can like, find out what's wrong with me first. Yeah, there's there's a bit of the race of if I do it first, and then no matter what anybody sells, it'll never be as bad as mine. So it won't hurt as bad. And then also just there's if if I'm the harshest critic, that's me being 
my best chance at being perfect and, mm. and noticing all the details. And so I could somehow then maybe be my best teacher or something. But when we get in, when we're being criticized and judged that way, our brains are actually going into low beta stress brainwave patterns. And so then our learning centers are turned off. We don't have access to creativity. We don't have access to new ideas. And what we do is further look, it's the survival mode brain patterns. And so what we do is look outside of ourselves to say, what's the problem that I can fix? So then it's, that's where some people, and everybody does it a little, but some people really focus on someone else. If I could just get them to change, then I'll be safer. And then, but then when you're looking at yourself from the outside, you become that thing that you can fix. But since there's no creativity and your learning centers are off, there's not a whole lot of curiosity happening. And then there's not a whole lot of, what if this isn't true? What if something else is possible? Like those thoughts just don't naturally come. And depending on how entrenched and miserable you feel inside, if they come from the outside, they actually get interpreted as further threats that you're doing something wrong and how you're currently thinking is wrong. So it just gets like slammed down, like, no, you know, no way. Wow, that that's super interesting. And I that's super... Um relatable as well for high functioning individuals I feel like mm -hmm. people who maybe are doing really well in their jobs or doing really well in some sort of area of their life maybe they're like a hardcore business person I don't know I feel like it's so much easier to focus on like what hasn't happened yet like what the next thing is and that beta brainwave and that high stress and lack of creativity that, you know, personally, I feel that, you know, I find it harder to create content when I've got a lot of stress going on, you know, recently went through a breakup mm -hmm. and creating content is just so hard, even though I love it so much. Right. And I'm sure many people feel the same way. So how do people move themselves out of this beta brainwave state so they can learn and be more creative and curious? Yeah, there are so many ways. And it's really about finding a way to relax. And in that, with the high functioning and with anybody, and it's most of us, who have a trauma patterning and background, a lot of times it's one, recognizing there's a huge emotional intensity going on and we haven't been well-trained or had a good model on how to handle emotional intensity so that it does just feel very overwhelming and like it keeps coming and keeps coming. So we have to find ways to first calm ourselves down and in that, there's a wealth of tools that can be mindfulness meditation, breathing, exercise is part of it, depending on how you're exercising and what the motivation is behind it. Like walking is very soothing. Being in nature will help. Um, EFT tapping, EMDR. There's so many actual tools to actually just get us a way to get back to center and say, I'm safe. Because that's what's actually happening in the brain is saying, I'm under threat. I could die here. And that's, and so we're looking at our outside world. So it's how can we call our energy back in so that we're looking more at our internal process and experience and being able to recognize that whatever we're feeling, it will pass. It's mm. permanent and it's not bigger than me because I'm the one creating it. So it can't actually overwhelm me. And it just a lot of that just takes practice. And it's one of those things where I, I continually try to find the one thing that you do the one time and it works forever. But it's really about practice because what we're doing is recalibrating and rewiring our nervous system because what we have done is practiced being stressed and overwhelmed and reacting to things. And so we have to practice non-reaction, calling back our energy and, and approaching things from a new way. So, and again, like I said, like you said, it is a lot of the high, high functioning people who have this, what trauma will do also is pull us from our body into our head because that was a safer place to live because we were experiencing trauma with our body. So we're like, yikes, get me out of here. Let me go in my head. And here's where I can fix all the problems. I cannot feel things as deeply. And so it's a matter of getting us back down to our, our bodies, back into our bodies so that we can 
literally like metabolize because chemicals, emotions are chemicals. So they just need to be metabolized. So learning how to actually run them through our body so that they're not then floating around everywhere and making us think more thoughts that generate more of that emotionality. If, if that makes sense, I kind of went all over if I do that. Are you tired of constantly feeling burnt out while trying to achieve your goals? Do you find yourself struggling to maintain motivation and productivity over long periods of time? I'd like to introduce you to the Goal Getting Journal, the ultimate solution for those of you who want to surpass their goals without burning out. Our journal is designed to help you set achievable goals, track your progress, and maintain a healthy work-life balance. With our journal, you'll discover practical strategies for managing stress, staying motivated, and avoiding burnout, including time blocking, habit stacking, and so much more. You'll also learn how to prioritize your tasks and maximize your productivity so you can get more done in less time. The Goal Getting Journal is perfect for anyone who wants to achieve their goals without sacrificing their mental health and well-being. Whether you're an entrepreneur, a student, or just someone who wants to make any positive change in your life, the Goal Getting Journal can help you stay on track and avoid burnout. And for Holistic Fitness Podcast listeners, you can get 20% off your first journal using the code HF podcast. Go to goalgettingjournal.com and type HF podcast at checkout to get your discount. So what are you waiting for? Order the Goal Getting Journal today and start getting your goals without burning out. Something I am curious about, you mentioned earlier that you were living outside of your body. Mm -hmm. So you were like an observer, almost Mm -hmm. like a third party. And you just mentioned like being in your head rather than in your body. How does someone like identify that they're in their head? And then how does someone like change that? So all of those chemicals can do all the things. So a lot of us know that we live in our head all the time. Like we're just up there. That's actually where most people are most of the time. And how we can tell that we've really disengaged from our bodies is if there is a time that we we have those time lapses, like we're driving home, how did mm. I even get here? I don't remember this. Yeah. We'll start to recognize that we are um, our shoulders, and a lot of us have jobs that also kind of push us this way, but our shoulders will get hunched. Our breathing will start to uh, become more shallow. Our eyebrows will come in, you know, our shoulders will end up by our ears. Um, We might recognize that we're having jaw is clenching. And some of us might recognize this when we wake up in the morning because we're not waking up feeling refreshed. So that might be that you have some chronic tension patterns, but it will be that we're more fatigued. We have more aches and pains because we're not getting the full range of motion and oxygenation into our bodies. And if we pay attention to our language, our language will be like, I'm tired. I can't stand this. This is never going to change. Like we'll start to have what I call the language of impossibility rolling in. Mm. And so it's just these little cues that kind of let us know we're not here. And another big one, too, is you just plain don't feel good and you're not Mm. in love with yourself in your life. That's the big one to where that's where, sadly, more people are living than not. but. When we look at that, how do I then change it all? It's not about changing it all at once. It's little changes will actually add up and things will change much sooner. But it is just recognizing I don't feel good and I don't feel lit up by my life. Then chances are absolutely you're living in your head and not your body. And then a lot of us know we're already running loops up here. The hamster wheel of we're having conversations with people that we haven't seen in two or three days or decades and wondering what this person, we know that that we're there. And, and if you're scrolling endlessly, if you're buying stuff and it's not really lighting you up, there's so many indicators of, hey, we're not addressing the real problem. The real problem is is coming back into our body. That's where the aliveness is actually going to be felt. Mm, yeah, that makes total sense. And I honestly feel like when people are wanting to lose weight, so obviously, you know, a lot of people, when they come by my social medias or my uh-huh. membership platform, it's all about like wanting to lose weight or wanting to feel better in your body. But a lot of folks, and it's really hard to make that mindset change of like, don't exercise more, don't change the way you eat, 
like learn how to be happy, learn how to manage your stress, learn how to do breath work, learn how to do all of these things that are going to increase your happiness. Because if you're exercising from that state, it's just going to be work. Absolutely. Absolutely. And because what happens when you're exercising from there, and this is where I talk a lot about goal setting, is having a goal that's not based on judgment. It's not based on fixing anything because there's nothing wrong with you. And But I know, I know so well that wanting to lose weight, because it was that magical number on the scale that was going to change things. And when somebody's like, you need to learn how to love yourself, I was like, that's the stupidest thing. You don't, you, mm. just, you just don't know anything about nutrition if you're just telling me to love yourself, you know, or you just haven't figured out a good exercise plan that works. And And like I said, I'll be like, you're not an expert then. But it really is when you turn it around and it comes from a place of self-love, everything that you do becomes easier. And it doesn't take somebody kicking your ass to get you out of bed to do it because you just want to do it because it's coming from a place of love. And when we're doing things from this stressful, there's something wrong with you. You got to fix this. It's not going to be okay until this is done. And we tend to do a lot of the wrong exercises that we don't like. That's especially for women, way too cardio heavy. That's actually going to further tank your adrenal glands, bump up the cortisol, which is going to make you feel more stressed, more tired. And that along with this extra judgment that's painful, like this harsh criticism that's painful, it's going to push you right into your coping mechanisms, which for a lot of us is compulsive eating or some other sort of non-beneficial activity that's not in line and contributory to uh, healthy physicality. Mm, but that triggers people. I mean, I know like some of the some of the posts that have gone viral where I'm li- literally like calories in, calories out isn't as important. Go on a hot girl walk, do Pilates, learn how to be happy, and then the trolls are like, "But calories in, calories out is the only way you lose weight." It's like, yeah, well, obviously. But how do you think that people actually can sustainably lose weight rather than grinding themselves every single time doing something they hate because they're trying to burn the most amount of calories and then fall back on these coping mechanisms as you know, you just mentioned, and it's, it's such a vicious cycle. And I'm really curious about your mindset of when you were one of those people you mentioned, like if someone said, Oh, just practice self love. You're like, well, that's a bit fucking airy fairy. Like, (laughs) it's like, can you tell me more about like your eating disorder and, and what the mindset was then and how you actually became to a place where you're like, Oh, this self love stuff, this is what helps keep me kind Mm -hmm. of going. Yeah. So back, back then I, I just thought I was fat. Like I just came into a family in the dieting in the eighties where it was grapefruit that you ate and everybody made a funny face. And I was like, (laughs) why are we doing this? And it's so you could lose weight. So I just grew up thinking that's just what you did as a woman. But then it's somehow in third grade, it's one of those weird cognitive, me and my best friend weighed exactly the same but she was taller. So from that moment, I was like, oh my God, I'm fat. And by the fifth grade, I was doing, I mean, fifth grade, 500 sit-ups to make, to try to get that belly. And then it just, just kind of kept going from there. And I had a sister, an older sister who actually got hospitalized for bulimia. So I knew that one was yucky. I didn't want that one, but I also didn't have the self-discipline for anorexia. So I fell into the eating disorders not otherwise specified because I had a really weak gag reflex. So I couldn't throw things up very well. So I just exercised in order to eat. So that if I ate something, I'd exercise. I'd exercise so I could eat something. And it was just really more of a really messed up mindset about food and what it was. But then when I was sitting in, I think it was an anatomy class in my first year of medical school, I was actually feeling like I had fat rolls and I was touching my chin and and my back to check that I wasn't actually looking like Java the Hutt, that I actually felt like that's what I looked like sitting in my chair. And I felt and I was like, no, I'm that's not there, but it feels really real. And I actually left class that day and I said, I have to find somebody because this thing is going 
it's going to eat me alive. Like I'm going to go down because I'm first year medical school and I'm running five miles a day, no matter the weather. And I would get so upset with myself that, I mean, you think about what we're going through in medical school, the amount of training that we have to have that a day off had to happen. And I would always allow myself one because, you know, I'm not crazy. Right. <laughs> uh, and but then there'd always at least be two because I would just be so tired or there would be so many other school demands. And I was still a perfectionist. So I had to get all my school things done that then but then I'd just be just enraged with myself for for having an extra day off and and still eating, you know, because the self-control just wasn't there and I couldn't. And it just it was just at war all the time. No matter what I ate, it was too much. If I ate it, it was wrong. If I enjoyed it, it, you know, and, and when I would go to friend's house, I would tell myself, well, I'm the fat girl. That's who I am in our friend's circle. I'm the fat wow. one. So I'm the one that they keep around so they feel good about themselves. And what a horrible thing to even think about your friends, that that's what they're thinking about me. And and then what what changed it or started to change it was first recognizing finally from the inside this is going too far and I've lost myself or I'm going to lose myself. And so finally recognizing and and then getting help from someone else, because it's like, this is too big for me. Cause if I would have figured it out, I, I would have, cause I am actually intelligent. So getting outside help was a big one. And one of the times in one of the nutrition, she, they had this little, Cause I didn't know. I thought they were actually the same thing. I have body dysmorphic disorder so that I actually cannot see and perceive myself accurately as far as my size. And I thought they were one in the same, but it, they're actually two sort of separate things. But she asked me to point out, they had these little drawings of what do you think your body looks like? And I was like, I'm there. And she goes, you're here. And wow. I was like, what? And I was like, no, you're just, and that, and, but again, this thing is so strong. I'm like, you're just trying to be nice to me. So you feel good about your job, you know, like, but it was, but it was the first time where it was like, and, and maybe I'm not seeing things correctly, but then I wish, especially with the eating disorder, I wish there was a one aha moment. Cause here's one of the things that I've also learned with all of my struggles is we are infinitely creative and the bottom can drop. It's our curiosity that actually determines what we're going to focus on. And if I'm curious about how things can get worse, what else could go wrong, they can and will, because that's what I'll put in. So a lot of people, and it is a matter, gratitude will change your brain. But because that had so much of a religious, you should be grateful. Gratitude was actually mm. hard for me to get to sometimes. And I felt like I was, okay, you got to be grateful, you know, like a little kid sitting at the dinner table. But it was when I started to be curious about maybe something else is possible Maybe it's not as bad as you think. Maybe there is a way out. Maybe there is something like, what if it could be different? What if, what if self-love helped, you know, what if it actually did help you burn calories? Like then I, then I'd actually be willing to use it, you know, but it was trying, it was, it was finally figuring out a way to be curious about something else mm. and then having a lot of these other outside influences who were more positive, who could actually they wouldn't because the people that I valued the most and would get the most from weren't just saying, oh, you look great. Don't worry about it, because that's what my mom would always do. It was people who would actually be inserting, hey, maybe your worldview is a little bit fucked up. You know, <laughs> maybe what you look like and the number on the scale actually isn't the entirety of reality. Maybe there's actually something else. Have you ever noticed that this person and then you start to notice that there are happy people who are overweight and they're legitimately happy. And there are people who are beautiful and gorgeous and they're getting divorced and not having good relationships. So it isn't as simple as thin is happy and fat is unhappy. It's there's a whole lot more into it. And then I even always had a really lovely relationship with a planet that I finally had a supervisor who said, okay, all mammals gain weight in the winter. Would you be willing to have your pants be a little bit tight because you gain five pounds, but you're working with nature and then mm. it will naturally drop off? And I was like, 
yeah, I could be okay with that. Bears sleep, elephants gain weight, like, and they all go this, you know, like that we're not meant to be this one tiny little size 100% of the time. And, you know, and then you look outside and be like, yeah, everything's like that. The seasons change and everybody wants the stock market to only go up, but it has its fluctuations like, oh, yeah, maybe there's wiggle room in here. And it's not just a slippery slope of if I gain two, two to six pounds that that's the end of the world, you know. And so it was really just inserting these other points of views that, hey, maybe it's a bigger, more complex thing going on and hey you've really tried beating yourself up for a long time and this is how it is so what if you actually just tried loving yourself a little bit you know just a little bit and see if that changes some things and it 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 did it really did those positively framed questions what if you know, mm-hmm. what if self-love can burn calories? And and that's like, I studied biomedical science too. And that's the absolute opposite of, you know, when you're a science girly and a lot of what I teach is like, so like, if I go back to when I was in college, just no, like it's, I'm just like, no calories in, calories out. So it's like asking yourself those questions are pretty brave. I am sorry. It is still insane to me that at third grade, you were comparing your weight to some, oh my goodness, I can't mm-hmm. get over that. And that's pretty normal, isn't it? Yeah. Uh-huh. That's insane. Because in third yeah. grade, you're like eight or nine years old. Right, right. That's crazy. It's so ingrained. Do you, I've, um, I haven't suffered from body dysmorphia, but I know that a lot of people have. And, you know, something I'm really big on is, hey, if you try to lose weight to like look better, a lot of bodybuilders have body dysmorphia. Like you're probably not fixing the problem if you, if that's way that's the motivation for your goals. Do you look back on that time and look at the way that you looked back then, and does it like blow your mind? Sometimes, because throughout my life, I've actually been lots of different shapes and sizes. So a lot of right. people would be like, "Yeah, poor thing you had," but I was like, "No, I've gained a lot of weight because with depression and my coping mechanism was eating. That was right. comfort. and then in in one situation, I got depressed and I didn't eat much and I lost weight. So then when it rolled around again, because that happened more than once and my mom was around, my mom just made sure I ate, but then I just would go to sleep because I didn't want to deal with life. So I definitely mm. blew up when you eat and then go to sleep. And those were the only two activities of day besides going to your job. So I've been a lot of different shapes and sizes, but with the body dysmorphia, so much of that is steeped in trauma. And it's, it's just... Uh, and and there's not a really great explanation of how or why it comes in. It's just a literal separation from your body to where it really is just about healing that we are spiritual beings having a physical experience that the physical body isn't a bad place to be and starting to have curiosity and interest in what I call the magical meat suit and Mm -hmm. that its function is not just about what it looks like. But when we start to then get curious about what it can do and what it allows us to do, then we start having a greater appreciation for it. And to some extent, when we recognize, hey, how I'm being with my body, how I look at it and interpret it isn't 100% accurate. Sometimes we just have to hold that in frame to sort of help us get out of the emotional thoughts that what I feel is real and it's true. Mm -hmm. And recognizing that feelings aren't facts, they're actually just feedback. So that when we're feeling, also recognizing, I used to feel fat all the time. Fat's not actually a feeling. It's (laughs) the interpretation of a feeling. So then you have to be like, what is the feeling then? Oh, it's a heaviness in my chest. It's a knot in my belly. It's a, I'm only breathing from here. I'm not pulling the air all the way down. It's it's a, just a slight nauseating feeling. It's just a yuck. It's just a yuck. It's a yuck feeling. But then when we start to sit with that yuck, it doesn't get as scary. And then all of a sudden it becomes more manageable, less intense and And then also it becomes less of a trigger to put us into that thought. It's I'm fat. It's something's wrong with me. 
yeah, you're so right. Feeling, <laughs> and I've never thought about that because I've felt that, you know, like when you've eaten a little bit too much or you had a big night out and then the next day you feel a bit fat, but you actually just feel sluggish and tired. <laughs> right. You're just aware of bloating. And, but then if we actually just sit there and feel it, and there will sometimes be emotions that come up because it might be, I'm disappointed with how I handled myself. I'm disappointed that I said yes when I meant no. I'm disappointed mm. that I thought this dessert was so much more important than my self-esteem and feeling good the next day. Um, for a lot of us, it's it's cheese and Mexican food. And, and if you put a plate of chips, I freaking love chips and salsa. So yes, tomorrow be damned. I could die at the end of the night. So let me eat all the chips and salsa. But more and more, I'm like, oh, the idea of the experience was better than the actual experience. So where it's actually, I've started practicing having some, but not all of them. <laughs> and, and how we can really shift this too, especially with the goal setting is to start changing who we believe ourselves to be. I'm no longer the fat girl at the party who finishes all the plates. I'm no longer, and I do joke, I am the cookie. I love cookies. So I am the cookie monster, but I can, I'm not the one who can't say no to a cookie. I'm not the person who has to finish all the chips and salsa. It's giving ourselves a different identity. And mm. then I'm no longer just the one trying to lose weight because then you're just a perpetual trier. It's, I am an athlete. I am somebody who loves myself. I am a badass and I'm a health food junkie. Or I I actually just am somebody who enjoys healthy food. Or I'm someone who likes to wake up feeling good. And so that's like, if I eat all of those, I won't. So I can only eat some of them, you know? Mm. And I'm somebody who loves myself. And I've now said... I'm going to be here loving you no matter what. So even if you do do that, the judgment's not going to come. And that feels weird at first, really weird at first. But when you start loving yourself instead of judging yourself for those things, everything changes. And then even the workout, it's like, I just, I recognize I actually just liked exercise but I didn't think I'd exercise if there if there wasn't a reason to. But I actually just like being strong. I like feeling like I could kick anybody's ass at any moment if they tried mm. to mess with me. And I actually just like moving and I have high movement requirements. So a lot of people with anxiety might find that it's not necessarily anxiety. You just have a lot of emotionality and aliveness that nobody has taught you how to move through your body. And exercise is actually fun. And a lot of people who are depressed, they actually just might need more rest to where they haven't had ever enough to bounce back to where they start getting curious about, oh, it could be different. And and so redefining who we believe ourselves as and the reason that we're doing things is, it sounds like a subtle shift, but it changes everything because the behavior, and you can, you can even learn this like in, in a relationship, you know, I'm sorry can be like, there's times where you receive the I'm sorry. Oh, he's really sorry. And there's times where it's I'm sorry. And you're like, you're full of shit. And you're telling me you're not telling me the truth. The same thing <laughs> is when you exercise, you can exercise because I love you. Or you can exercise because you're a fat piece of crap. And I don't like looking at the mirror at you. And how you exercise and how you feel exercise and the results that are going to come from that are going to be so tremendously different. And since we're with us 100% of the time, we are our best crash test dummies and guinea pigs. So if you're going to love somebody, why not just give yourself a little bit of that and see what happens? Hey, Holistic Fitness fam, a quick message from one of our sponsors, Ned. As you all know, I recommend good nutrition, movement and stress management practices before supplementing so you know what type of supplementation that your body actually needs. For me, I supplement with very few products, but Ned is one of them. I'm a type A, high energy, ambitious business girly with massive goals. And sometimes I honestly just need to chill out and relax a bit. I've found that both Ned's de-stress and sleep blends fit in with my busy lifestyle and ambitious goals, but I was honestly not a big fan of CBD products before trying Ned, mostly because of the culture surrounding weed. I just didn't want something that was going to alter my state of mind so that I became much less of a goal getter or less ambitious. That was until I learned about full spectrum hemp and their benefits. Ned blends a chock full of premium CBD and a full spectrum hemp of active cannabinoids. 
Ned's full-spectrum hemp oil nourishes the body's endocannabinoid system to offer functional support for stress, sleep, inflammation, and balance. These products are science-backed, nature-based solutions that offer an alternative to prescription and over-the-counter drugs. All of Ned's full-spectrum hemp oil is extracted from USDA-certified organic hemp plants grown by an independent farmer named Jonathan in Colorado. I'm obviously a big fan, but don't take just my word for it. Ned CBD products have over 2,000 five-star reviews, and they work with incredible partners in the medical field like Dr. Caroline Leaf, Dr. Christian Gonzalez, and Dr. Will Cole. Ned is providing Holistic Fitness podcast listeners a very special discount. If you'd like to give Ned a try, listeners get 15% off Ned products with the code Lori Lee. L-O-R-I-L-E-E. Thanks, Ned, for sponsoring the show and offering a natural remedy to bring balance to so many people's well-being. I resonated with so much that you just said, Joylin, especially that getting curious with like why you're feeling a certain way, like anxiety. Personally, I think my ex-boyfriend, what did he used to say? Like, you needed to take me on a walk like a dog. Like, that sounds terrible. But it's like, sometimes you can just have so much pent up energy that you just need to go on a run. And so, even though like, I've always told myself that I don't like running, I'll run for 30 minutes and I'll run like three and a half miles or whatever, just because I need to get energy out. So I mm-hmm. went from telling myself I didn't like running to running to get as much energy out as I could. Doesn't uh-huh. mean I don't do other ex- exercises, but it's really insane when you do like shift your mindset in terms of like what you're getting curious about. It's mm-hmm. insane, which brings us to goal setting. I, you know, we briefly touched on goal setting and you've also talked a lot about lots of different things you can do, like EFT, EFT, emotional freedom Mm -hmm. tapping, yeah. And then, um, you know, breath work and yoga and walking. And that's a lot of different things. So Mm -hmm. can you tell me more about like how you set goals with people who maybe are in that state of being really pessimistic Mm -hmm. and Mm -hmm. how you kind of get them to that happiness state? Absolutely. So most of my clients are very intelligent high achievers. And so in that, for whatever reason, tended to be gifted kids who, if they're not immediately good at it, say I'm bad at it and Mm -hmm. overthink and think negatively about themselves. So these are the people that, that I work with the most. And the problem that we have right now with traditional conventional goal setting is that most of it is based on judgment. You know what you don't like, so let's fix that. And then somehow magically the good stuff will just start coming. But anytime we base it on a fixing, even if we win, we lose. Because then even if we lose weight, it's because we were fat. And so there's this resistance, this inner resistance that comes up that will increase the self-sabotage. And there's also always that little wounded part of us that is actually just so desperately thirsty for unconditional love to where even when we win, we lose because the love was conditional. Oh, I like me now because I look like this, but but I know as soon as I don't look like this, the love's going to go away. And what I always say is until you trust it, you'll test it. So this Mm. is why we end up yo-yoing a lot is because we didn't actually learn how to love ourselves. So either it's going to be our weight or some other area of our life that that we're going to fall back and and need and the invitation for self-love is going to show up. So when we're doing things out of judgment, it doesn't work um, because everything will be based on the past. So it will be who we were and what we were doing and making the past our point of reference and our fixation and, and focal point. And what you where your attention goes, your energy flows and what you appreciate, appreciate. So if we're looking at the past, that's what we're going to create more of. So we actually strengthen the yuck is is kind of what happens. And then when we're also finding a target or a goal based on judgment, it isn't enlivening enough to really keep us from getting distracted, to stay intrinsically motivated because it's only about fixing a problem. So the first thing that I do, it's what I've created and called the future forward focus. It's starting to get in touch with who do you want to be? And so the two big questions I ask is, how do you want to show up in your life? Because 
we we know so much about what we don't want and that's a starting point but it isn't enough to carry us forward we actually have to know what it is that we want otherwise our subconscious is going to kick in and say because anything that's uncertain is certain death so if i don't really know where i'm going then that that means the world ends and so i just have to go back to who i was cuz i at least know i'll survive that way and that's just what the subconscious is meant to do your subconscious thinks you're precious. It just wants you to stay alive. And the way that it knows how to do that is to be who you were and do what you were doing, whether or not it actually worked, because it has no imaginative creativity. It doesn't have mm. a capacity for that. It's just that's not the function of it. It remembers. That's all it does is it remembers. So what we do is the future forward and we start connecting with a future and build memories because your subconscious, your body, and also your brain can't determine real from imagined. So that if we start being, how do I want to show up? I want to show up confident. I want to show up sexy as hell. I want to <laughs> show up being able to say, I not eating sugar. I am, you know, uh, eating more green leafy vegetables. I'm trying a high impact or low intensity, you know, workouts. Like I'm doing these things because I love myself. Like, how do I want to show up? I want to show up calm. I want to show up peaceful. I want to show up confident. Those are the, one of the biggest ones, or I want to show up happy. That was mine. I'm like, I just want to know what this happiness thing is. And then we start saying, okay, then you start choosing from there for there. So what would a happy person choose? Would they tell themselves the things that you're telling yourself? And a lot of us know immediately, oh, no, that, <laughs> that's going to have to go. OK, would they be choosing this food or that food? And sometimes you actually just don't know. That's where we start recognize our body as a different way, because. If we do something that we don't like, we immediately go into the we'll notice the thoughts get bad. The eyebrows come together. The shoulders go up. The breathing gets we feel kind of contracted. That'll be like, that's a no. So whatever that thing was, that's a no. The the yeses are going to be like crushing it or just mm -hmm. a just a sigh, like a full deep breath. So we start using our body as a feedback tool and 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 looking at our thoughts and our feelings as thoughts and feelings instead of truth. And so mm -hmm. with the goal setting, it's to get this future forward. How do I want to show up? And here's the other big difference. What do I want to add to my life? We keep thinking we have to take things out of our life. And then life isn't as fun because it's just about rules and subtracting things. So what do you want to add? And then if you want something in your life, you put it there. So if you want more love, you put more love in. If you want more peace, you put the peace in. You have to be the peace. If you want more calm, you be the calm presence. If you want more laughter, you be the silly one. Like you start delivering what you're asking for instead of demanding it come from the outside. So that's the huge shift in goal setting. And when we're looking at how do I want to show up and what do I want to add to my life and when you really start allowing yourself, because this, it, you start little, you're going to start with the, uh, well, I don't like this. So I want this. Okay. That's good. But then we start experimenting and playing. Then we're like, I've never said this out loud. Can I say this? Can I say, I want to be on TV. Can I say, I want to make a million dollars. Can I say I want, and we start going big. Those are the things that actually Maxwell Maltz talks about in psycho cybernetics, having a big dream is a component of happiness. It's the thing that gets mm. us out of bed. It's the thing that says, oh, I'm having a bad hair day and I still have green stuff stuck in my teeth and I went on a Facebook Live like that. I can't believe it, but you know what? I don't care because this is my big goal and I think it's still gonna work for that. Or I don't, you know, like if I wanna run a marathon, if that's where I'm starting and I say, I wanna run a marathon, yeah, I didn't sleep as well as I would have liked um, and I didn't eat, but you know what? I'm I'm going to get up and I'm going to do it today. And that means that maybe my interval might be I'm walking a little bit more than running today. But the the but I triumphed because I got out of bed and I and I identified as someone who's training instead of being someone who stays in bed. Or if I stay in bed, I am going to love myself through that and say, it's OK, we're going to try again tomorrow. You know, instead of it being a one day leads to two days, leads to three days off of training, it's 
self-love allows us to be way more resilient. So it's not these big, huge gaps and falling off and it being such a struggle to get back on. We get on much, much quicker when we're loving ourselves instead of criticizing ourselves. And that's a big shift um, that I, that I've started to recognize. Self-love actually builds resilience and resilience is what allows you to be persevere and persistent. Mm. And that is what it's the consistency and the persistence that means, you know, fall down seven times, stand up eight, you win. That's, that's how we win. Absolutely. And people think it's so, you, you shared so many great tips in that, by the way. So many people think that self-love is airy fairy and a little bit woo woo and stuff, but as I know, it's what keeps you going. It's what makes you not burn out. It what's keeping sustainable. Even that simple thing you mentioned about like, what can I add to my life? You can do that with nutrition too. What can I add to this meal? Doesn't you don't have to remove the grilled cheese sandwich. Maybe we add some tomato and spinach, but you still get to have those carbs and and that cheese. It's like, what can I add here? Yeah. I've really enjoyed this conversation and I could honestly talk to you forever, honestly, Joylyn. But you know, it has come to time to, to, to close here. And we do have a final question on this mm-hmm. podcast. And that question is, if you were sitting across from your 20 year old self right now, what one sentence of advice would you give her? If I were to talk to my 20 year old self and I might cry here, I think I would look at her in the eyes and say, baby, you are so beautiful. Just let it go. It's not yours. Because a lot of us sensitive people picked up a lot of beliefs and feelings from those around us and believe that the trauma was the truth of life. And then have been trying and making all of our feelings true and real. And there are so many. And and for those of us who are emotional, our feelings are very precious to us. But if I could have just let so many of those thoughts and feelings flow through me instead of trying to hold on to them, I would say let it go. And the other piece that that I might also add is the good is real. The good is as real as the bad. Mm. And that brings us back to the start where you mentioned, you know, you'd kind of gaslight yourself into believing that the good wasn't real and and find all that evidence where the bad was real. And and that's really what can help us spiral. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. It's been wonderful having you on. And I'm sure many people listening are realizing that self-love and happiness is the missing ingredient in why they've been yo-yoing. Where can people find you so we can learn more about your work? I'm so glad you asked because I am easily findable on Facebook. There's the Happiness Clinic page, but I also have the Happiness Clinic group. And that's where I'm running the self-love experiment because a lot of us know self-love as a concept or a theory. And I'm actually giving, here's what it looks like. It's not just painting your nails or taking a bubble bath. Those things may be included, but it's really about how to set boundaries um, set down your phone, things like that. The actual stories of my life and tips and tools of this is what self looks like. And this is how you can put it in your life for those of us who only know it as an airy fairy concept. So the happiness clinic group is probably the best bet to give me. And I do power hour every Wednesday where I'm coaching live every Wednesday at noon Pacific time. So Facebook's probably the easiest place to find me, the happiness clinic. Amazing. I've really enjoyed having you here, Joylyn. Thank you so much for joining us. Oh, thank you so much. This was a pleasure. And for everyone listening at home, in the car or cleaning or wherever you are today, eat well, move well, breathe well. And until next time, keep shining. <laughs>